Hey, this is John Leon Guerrero. Our guest today is Colonel John McKay. He's an adjunct professor of Latin American geography at Sacramento State. Go Hornets! He started his own education growing up in Peru and Mexico, where he worked for his room and board in the ore cars of a mine by the time he was 10. He became an expert horseman and communicated with his co-workers in Cachua and Spanish. He eventually attended the U.S. Naval Academy, was selected as an Olmsted Scholar to attend Universidad Complutense de Madrid, where he did all of his work in Spanish. He earned an M.A. in government with a specialty in national security affairs from Georgetown and a second M.A. in national security strategy from the National War College in Washington, D.C. He has served and protected us unselfishly as a U.S. Marine with an unmatched knowledge of Spanish-speaking cultures, which came in handy during the Cuban Missile Crisis. He served two combat tours in Vietnam where he was twice wounded and went on to lead Marines in humanitarian efforts in Europe, West Africa, and of course Latin America. He's a lifetime member of Disabled American Veterans and the Military Order of the Purple Heart. He has an in-depth understanding and appreciation of the current political, military, and business climate in the Spanish-speaking world. And today, you'll hear him discuss some of those topics with Pete and our frequent co-host, Major Scott Husing. We're deeply honored to have him. Here's our guest, Colonel John McKay. Lions Rock Productions. This is Jay this Moore. Is Greg Proops. This is Jordan Harbinger. This is Dexter from The Offspring. This is Nathan this is East. Sebastian Younger. This is Rick Moran. This is Stuart Copeland. This is Mick Gillette. This is Andy Summers. Hey, this is Scott Baxter. This is Gabby Reese. This is Rob Bell. Hey, this is John Leon Guerrero. Hey, and this is Pete A. Turner. <laughs> Colonel John McKay, and we're on the Break It Down show. And now, the Break It Down show with John Leon Guerrero and Pete A. Turner. We are over here with Scott Husing, who set all this up, producer. This is great. Uh, I would give your bio, but it's ridiculous. So I'm going to have John do that in the opening because the things you've done and the places you've been and the people you've advised, uh, it's a significant list. So thanks for coming on, man. I really appreciate it. Well, you. thank you for having me. And I, I feel honored that I'm with you. Is this your first podcast? It is my first podcast. Nice. I've done radio, nice I've done television, but I've never done a podcast. We can tell everyone first. We got to acknowledge Margot, your gorgeous wife, is sitting here too. She joined in. She can <laughs> jump in. She's my official BS flag. Like if the colonel starts spouting off, or there's lapses in memory or exaggerations, right? Like Margot's going to jump. It in. It didn't go but, like uh, that. <laughs> yeah, that's important. Yeah. That's important. That's a great thing to have in the room too. Is like you know, because mm -hmm. you know the military wives network, they they don't let anything slide on us. So, but we met at the Marines Memorial Club, and I was so fascinated just meeting. And getting a brief introduction and then reading, you know, Colonel McKay's bio, it's just, it's nuts, man. It's really nuts. We're, we're the ones that are fortunate to, to yeah. just hang out with you. Yeah, like the smallest thing on your bio is like, oh, and by the way, he's a professor at Sac State. Yeah. <laughs> Come on. So tell us a little bit about your upbringing. You, you, you know, your father was raised in the Depression, how that influenced you and how that moved you into ultimately – enlisting in the Marine Corps, because both of us are Mustang officers. Yeah. As I said, I grew up in Peru. I went down there uh, right before I turned six years old. I left the last time when I was 16 years old. My father being a product of the Depression, I'm one of three brothers. We're, we're all Marines. But he, he insisted that we work. And he had a very high-level position as chief engineer of a very big mining company. The company had its own railroad, which was extensive, standard gauge railroad. It also had very large haciendas, and there's a backstory to that, which I won't go into. Starting at age eight, my father was chief engineer, and he had me work on the weekends on the railroad. Now, that's not what you think it sounds like. I started out in the carpenter shop. And, and I loved it. I mean, eight years old. And that is where I bless my father because I picked up Spanish very quickly. Nobody in the carpenter shop spoke English. And there were a couple that didn't speak Spanish. They spoke, spoke Quechua. And I just, I fell in love with the Peruvians. I progressed up and uh, starting about age 10, I started riding the ore trains. Uh, it was all steam. The engineer, the fireman, the brakeman, they were all Peruvians. 
uh, there was there was no gringos on the trains. And uh, two of the engineers I became very close to, their primary motive power was a Bayer Peacock 280 steam locomotive manufactured in Britain. We have no idea what that means in the audience. I mean, it's got two front, what's called plow wheels. Okay. They're, they're trailer wheels to stabilize the front weight of the boiler. And then the four, there's four drivers on each side. So you designated the two pilot wheels and the four drivers. It's a two, eight, zero. And there's no trail wheel between the engine and the and the tender. Pete, I'm actually going to be the smart one in on this one because I actually knew what that means after hours of watching trains in uh, nice. Chicago area on Sundays after church with my dad. He's a <laughs> massive railroad nut. So I did have that piece of trivia. So nice. I always like to one up Pete. He always he's so much smarter than me. So you know. <laughs> well, I didn't like I, to know that. I, but what year was this that we that went just... down there? Let me see. It was during the Korean War, fifty one. Fifties, yeah. And uh, my father was still in the Navy Reserve as a commander. He got permission to to go back, go out of country. Uh, he wasn't going to be called up for the Korean War. But anyway, I, I did that every every weekend. And then when I turned nine, again, the Haciendas was run by a fellow by the name of Bill Snyder. He was a uh, sheep man from Montana. And his assistant was a uh, fellow from uh, Texas, Pete S- uh, Sellers, who was a cattleman. And that was always an interesting interaction. People in this country don't realize about the range wars between cattlemen and, and sheep. sheep sure, raising. yeah. But uh, starting at nine years old, every summer, I was put out on one of the haciendas and, uh, by myself, and I was working for room and board. That was it. And again, it was all Peruvians. And I'm a good horseback rider. I learned how to ride well. And particularly a Peruvian Indian, they're fatalistic people, but they're hard. They're very hard people. And you fell off the horse, you better What damn. type of horses do they ride down there? Oh, they're shaggy things. Yeah. You, that altitude, because we lived at 14,000 feet. Oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> and some of the Haciendas were at 15,500 feet. And if you brought a horse up from the uh, coast, and, and they tried it. They brought a couple of Morgan horses up. Their hearts burst. Uh, they, couldn't, sure. they couldn't stand the altitude. Same and, thing happened with the CIA brought mules, donkeys. You know, they're like, we're going to bring these out to Afghanistan. I said, they brought like, you know, Missouri Valley mules. Yeah, it didn't work. And then they're like, it's okay. The next generation of mules will will be hardier. And like someone had to break it to them. Like, it's not, there's not a subsequent generation. Hey, hey, (laughs) wake up, Bobo. (laughs) I mean, really? Somebody, oh, well, mules reproduce. Yeah, Yeah. well, that that shows your ignorance. Yeah. You know, a mule is all straight to a donkey and a horse. Sure. And. And, and the, it wasn't just the heart thing, but Missouri Valley mules want to eat. Yeah, they eat a lot more. Right. And and the other thing, they couldn't eat the puma grass right. in the Andes. They had mules in Peru, but they were locally bred. But the horses, I swear, they were descendants of what uh, Pizarro brought when he came and conquered the Incas. Uh, small, shaggy, you know, some horse, I'm serious, 12, 13 hands. Wow. That's small. Yeah. And when we first got there, my father had horses for all three of us. I'm one of three brothers. And his his way of teaching us to ride, we started bareback. And, you know, when I was seven or eight, I got an Indian blanket. I thought that was really moving up. You know, <laughs> taught me how to cinch it with a rope on the horse and, uh, you know, on and off. And uh, I think by 10 or something, uh, he bought me a McClellan saddle. Nobody knows what a McClellan salad is. It's the old Civil War. Sure, salad. yeah. And we just, uh, well, before we left Virginia, we donated to the Calvary Museum of Fort Leavenworth. So how old are your brothers? Are they? Are you the oldest, middle? I'm the oldest, and the oldest? Jim is two years younger, and then Douglas is two and a half years younger. I can't imagine growing up like that, too. And like, how many other like eight or nine year olds are just hanging out, like working in the carpentry shop? And to yeah. put that into perspective generationally, you know, like we couldn't even 
let our kids walk to school now and like yeah. <laughs> John's out here speaking Spanish at age eight and uh hanging out with the kicking hobos off the train. <laughs> Mainly because I think it was a mining community and very sparsely populated. The ore trains ran between La Roya and Cerro de Pasco. Cerro de Pasco was a... The Incas had mined there. The Spaniards had really expanded it. Cerro de Pasco was at, at, at about 14,500 feet. You went across the Junin Pampa, which is just daunting. And then Lake Junin, which is probably one of the most polluted lakes in the world. Mm because of mine runoff. But, yeah, and then, then the haciendas, uh, I mean, I lived in the quarters where the Indians lived, except for one of the haciendas. There was no running water. There was no toilets. And, uh, you know, at 14, 15,000 feet, it gets cold. So that, that austere life kind of really prepared you for being thrust into the Marine Corps as an infantryman, doesn't it? <laughs> well, I, again, I credit my father. My brothers disagree with me, but I credit my father for the plain and simple reason. What his intent was, he was a silent man. Margo knew him, not well, but knew him. He could not express emotion. And it was simply, this is what you're going to do. Yeah. And I loved it. Uh, and, and, and I credit him for what I am today that I survived. A lot of it had to do with him starting me out the way he did. So, um, you know, my first love affair, lost my virginity at 18, I mean 14. My introduction to racism, the girl was Peruvian, which was did not go over well. She was dark, not dark, but darker than her parents. Her parents were whiter than anybody at this table. And he was high up in the accounting department. And I was not allowed in her house, and she was not allowed in my house. She was 17, I was 14. <laughs> and, you know, I couldn't articulate it, but there was something wrong about that. And I stayed in touch with her uh, until uh, I actually enlisted in the Marine Corps. And on subsequent trips to Peru, I was in a position where I could check, and she's done very well. She's still alive and mm. has grandchildren but I did not intrude. <laughs> so, yeah, I grew up fast. And I think, tell them what you thought when you met me in high school. I can speak now? <laughs> oh. Yeah. John just wasn't like any other American boy. You know, all of you grew up playing uh, sandlot baseball or, you know, football, whatever, but he was not interested in any of those things. He was a, a very studious. He was, he was just entirely different than anybody I'd ever met. And, you know, he still is, but... That's what I would say. <laughs> was, was was that something that like attracted you to him? Well, no. I mean, honestly, in high school, we were only friends. Yeah, that's um, true. We didn't start dating until he was at the Naval Academy. I had fantasies. We need not go into those. <laughs> <laughs> but she was she. Margot is very very clever, and I was in algebra two. Uh, that was a senior course. Margot was a junior. Margot was in algebra too. And that's when we got to know each other. I met her father, who was a uh, JG at Pearl Harbor, won a bronze star that day, was a beach master at Kwajalein, retired as an admiral. That, that's where we met, and, and, and it's very true. I mean, I would go over to her house, not for a date, and, you know, she came by my house less frequently, unfortunately. So you guys met in high school, and then where did you go to high school at? Well, I'd gone to boarding school for two years while my parents were in South America. Okay. One was a Quaker school, overloaded on religion at the Quaker school. Been drawing yeah, on, it ever since. on it And then I went to a very elite boys' school in Colorado Springs, which is still in existence. And my father came out, uh, taking a, another position with Utah International in San Francisco. And I will be very frank with you, my two years in public high school, I hated it. I, I, I absolutely hated it. My father insisted I play football. I hate football. The only sport I'd ever played, and I was very good at it, was soccer. Nobody played soccer then. Mm. And quite frankly, Margot and a, a British kid, Tony, who was also a transfer, and one of the very few emphasized very few Jewish kids in school. 
Those were my only friends. I played football. I hated it. My father never came to any of my games. I was, was lousy at it. I, I just didn't like it. How did you balance that with academics in high school? I, I think uh, my brothers and I have talked about this because they did not do Phi Beta Kappa in high school. And I lost myself in the studies. It was something that I could, you know, my parents left me alone if I studied. I thought we had good instructors. And all I could think about was getting the hell out of Dodge. And, and uh, that led to the next stage. I, my father, from very early on, although he was not in the Marine Corps, he, he was an officer in the Seabees during World War II. And we were rambunctious kids, the three boys, and, and Margo knows us all. And, you know, his, his panacea for everything, wait till the Marines get a hold of you. Well, at age 16, I was ready, and I started visiting the recruiter. And to this day, I remember Staff Sergeant Kelly. <laughs> and Staff Sergeant Kelly was uh, South uh, Boston. And the other thing that I decided, because my father made it very clear, that he would not pay for any of our college. We, we would have to go to college, and we'd have to work. And I got the idea, and it was true, that I could get appointed from the ranks to the Naval Academy. And I, I know my father thought that was ridiculous. He didn't say so. And I talked to Staff Sergeant Kelly. Now, Staff Sergeant Kelly was a street fighter, Korean War veteran. And he was just as honest as his day is long. And he said, it's almost impossible, but you can do it. Which is a kind of an oxymoron when it comes to speaking to any type of recruiter, because normally the stories go, you know, they feed you a line of yeah. bullshit and like no. rope guys in. So, but I think again, generationally is like, we don't have, you have to everything to prove to us. If you want to join this group here, we don't really have to sell you anything. And that is so different from what's going on with the guys who are even young junior officers to me that are now field grade officers on recruiting duty. And, uh, but you know, John, it's interesting that you you talk about how you credit your father who who instilled like this high degree of discipline as far as work and and earning everything. And then, you you know, you transitioned to high school and you, you did well academically. And then, you know, your dad still at that point is like you're paying for your own college and you better find a way. And uh, we all and three did. Was that kind of like something you respected from your dad when you look back at how he reared you and and. It, we knew no, nothing else. Yeah. You know, I knew kids that were, you know, when when I was in high school in the States, I knew kids that, you know, Fountain Valley School in Colorado Springs is still a very elite school. And, and they were sending people to Yale and Harvard. And even then, that wasn't cheap. And he said, no, you work your way through college. So, I mean, there's so many, like all of us here as veterans, we join... And I found this as a study, and it'd be a great academic discussion or study is, you know, people that come from broken homes love to join the military because there's a lack of discipline and a lack of structure. And they're drawn to that, I think, innately. And then there's other groups who are reared in these very disciplined families. Like your dad was an officer, and you're kind of inculcated into the Marine culture or the military culture. And like, that's a natural draw to you. And then there's another group that are immersed in that and they want nothing to do with the military so you made that decision and you enlisted in the marine corps at a, at a early age with your intent to use that as your entree yeah as your conduit to go to go to, go to college to get an education i mean the whole time you're thinking that's higher right. education that's and, right and still is i mean to this day you're still teaching at the collegiate level so we can talk about that in a bit but but there's another aspect to me and Get your red flag ready. I'm a, <laughs> I'm a maverick. Okay. I've always been a maverick. And, you know, I, I by the time I turned 17, I turned 17 in October 1961. And, you know, I'm, I'm talking to Staff Sergeant Kelly. He said, well, you're 17. you got to have your parents' consent to enlist. Now, two things happened. I said, I think we can do it if you will allow me to suggest how we do it. And he said, talk to me. And I said, well, if you can come by some night 
about 8 o'clock, because cocktail was day resort and cocktail hour in my parents' house. And cocktail hour was minimum two old fashions, two martinis. And I figured 20, 100, 8 o'clock at night, they'd probably be on drink number two. And, and my father had high regard for Marines. And I said, also, Staff Sergeant Kelly, can you put the, I didn't know what the hell they were called, blue trousers on with the stripe and the shirt with the tie and, and your ribbons? Yeah, we can do that, McKay. <laughs> and he came by, and it was cocktail number two. And he walked into the house. Margo knows that house. And God, my father, oh, the Marines are right. Staff Sergeant Kelly, what can I get you to drink? And, you know, Kelly was Irish. He wasn't drinking tea. <laughs> and so, you know, by that time, my parents are into drink number three. Kelly is good, strong drink. And, you know, it just kind of slipped in, you know, my father's, where are you been? What did you do in Korea? And, then, and oh, Mr. and Mrs. McKay, we, we got some paperwork here for John to go into the Marine Corps when he graduates from high school. Mm-hmm. And this would just facilitate and make things faster if you don't mind signing. Oh, anything for the Marine Corps. <laughs> well, they signed me away. And two other things happened about a month and a half later. We didn't really argue at the table, but there were a few tense moments. And I can't it wasn't grades. It, it, it was something minor. And my father said, well, wait till you get yourself in the Marine Corps. And I said, I already am. And that was bad. I mean, I, there was no fisticuffs. Already. My mother started crying. And he said, let me see those papers. <laughs> and they realized then. About six weeks later. <laughs> six months later. No, no, six weeks. Oh, six weeks later. And it was very tense. And I went down that week, it seemed to me, to Staff Sergeant Kelly, and I said, well, I said, I've got the paperwork now. I said, I want to ship right now to boot camp. And he leans across the table, and I'm going to use profanity. He said, McKay, number one, if you don't finish high school, I will make sure you never get into the Marine Corps. Never. Do you understand that? (laughs) And I go, yes, I'm sorry. You fucking finish high school and then come back and talk to me about shipping. Do you understand? (laughs) (laughs) And that made a much bigger impact on me than my father. Yeah. And I never bothered Staff Sergeant, although he did come to graduation. That's awesome. (laughs) And oh, well, the rest is history. And and uh, I I was very upfront. I told my uh, drill instructor, Staff Sergeant Thomas, senior drill instructor, you know what I wanted to do. You know I was still a screw. I was still a fuck up. But he took me seriously. And you remember it was a week three. You go to the rifle range, and Camp Matthews was still open then. That's before your time. University yeah, yeah. of San Diego is there now. Yeah, Edson, Mike Edson Range now. Yeah, Edson Range. Well, I've got pictures of it in my cruise book from boot camp, but it was free qual day, 200-meter line, offhand. I threw one in the deuce ring. Staff Sergeant Thomas came up, and the PMI, primary marksmanship instructor, they had the two canteens, and they just pulled my belt back and both started kidney punching me. And Staff Sergeant Thomas says, you wouldn't make a pimple on an officer's ass. <laughs> uh, I, I fired an expert the next day. But anyway. <laughs> a style of motivation. <laughs> One technique. Yeah. Which yeah. is more, you know, that was done back then. And I think, you know, we've, I mean, we've evolved as institutionally as a Marine Corps and you know, we talk about why guys join the Marines now and, you know, how we lead and, you know, the types of Marines. I mean, from that type of training and, like, everything you experienced, I mean, what do you think about how we're training Marines now? Do you think we're too soft on them? I don't have enough knowledge. Yeah. You know, the last time... Well, we got to get you down to the depot then, like... And, and... Take, take, Margo yeah. loves Paris Island. Yeah. She's saying no. No, we we went to a graduation. I I haven't. I've never been on recruiting duty. I was never stationed at the depot. Yeah. 
You know, I followed vicariously uh, General Krulak's crucible thing, which I thought was a good thing. But I've never trained. I can't, I'm not qualified to comment yeah. on how the training compares now. And well, it's, you know, the, the, the point I'm making is like, they, that was a different style of leadership. It was very hands-on. They, they felt like, you know, you know, physical abuse was, uh, you know, negative reinforcement was highly encouraged and accepted and commonplace. Yeah. And now it's turned 180 where, you know, they can't do that. But, uh, I mean, my position is, I think I was kind of on the outs of that, you know, it was more like a good hockey check we'd get from our drill instructors when I went through boot camp. It was never face punches or kidney punch, you know, they knew like that era was waning fast, but I look now at the Marines that are graduating our entry level training, both enlisted and officers. And, you know, some people compare them in generationally say oh they're softer now they're not going to be as tough they won't fight as hard no, i think they're wrong they're, they're, yeah, they're proving right. it wrong right now as we're winning and fighting still to this day in these two wars we're still yeah. still doing and um it's, it's interesting too because i think we have this this i don't know what it is like this generational guilt or this this war envy because like oh because you know, John, you know, was in Vietnam and they lost so many thousands of people during that war. And we've only lost this many. Right. We're not as tough. Or we didn't do this. Like, and when I talk to veterans about that and John's shaking his head, no, yeah. is if we've lost more Marines in Iraq and Afghanistan, would we be just as good? Would we have as many Silver Star Navy Cross recipients right. as we did in World War II in Vietnam if we've gotten more guys killed? It stymies me to think of the, the way the public looks at our military through that lens, which our own military looks at their own military through that lens. It's, it's some strange phenomenon. I can't really articulate that well. I think that has been prevalent in the Marine Corps since World War I, mm. that there's a very perverse pride. Do you know how many we got killed at Chosan? Yeah. Do you realize how many died at Guadalcanal? It's it's almost sort of a reverential honoring of death, and you know that that harks back to to the Nazis and the Germans. And I, I would I would argue that because we've lost less soldiers and Marines in these wars, we're better at what we do. We're employing better technology and leadership styles and tactics. I mean, it just the the numbers are there, and I mean. Granted, that it, we're not fighting conventional force either, so it's it's a different playing field, and the dynamics are so. But there is an evolution, fluid. yeah. In how we like we are better at leadership. We have more tools to lead with, and then like uh, Johnny Walker's wife. We had a guy named Johnny Walker on the show, and he did so many SEAL missions as an interpreter from Iraq that the SEALs say you can wear a trident and you're part of us, and so he's 100 percent in their in their brotherhood. But his wife was telling a story of her. And her kids in Iraq, and they were going to school, and all of a sudden a firefight breaks out. And, you know, she's running across the street to try to do something for her kids, and what's she going to do in a firefight? And then an American comes up, and this is what we ask of our young people that, right, like that are softer. And that guy says, ma'am, you go over there and be safe, puts himself in between the line of fire to cover her. And then they start addressing her kids yeah. while there's a firefight that they're fully engaged in. You know, and that is a, a totally different dynamic, not better, just a completely super challenging liquid dynamic where everything is constantly in motion for these young guys that are out there doing it. How do you prepare for that? You know, you can't just kick someone in the head and tell them to get tougher. Um, well, the other thing, and I'm not, you know, I haven't, uh, I haven't been to Iraq. Uh, I haven't been to Afghanistan. I was in Afghanistan a long time ago when the Mujahideen were the good guys. What I understand, I don't know. There's not today, and correct me if I'm I don't feel that there's the put down racial, religious, ethnic attitude on the part of most U.S. forces that you saw in it Vietnam. It is, I have discussed this with academics like you is, Generally, generally, it's funny you were talking about your first exposure to racism, and you look generationally World War One. The the way we describe the enemy, Krauts or Nips or Gooks or in Afghanistan and in Iraq, in Iraq and these wars have been fighting. I never recall my Marines using those. 
right. derogatory or racial slurs. It was always the enemy or the insurgents. And I think that because our young men and women who fight, they they definitely are taught and they learn this cultural understanding, which is I submit is uh, that's how you win the war. That I mean, and we're we're not because no one's defined what winning is to us at the executive level. But nonetheless, the people that are doing the actual fighting, they're winning. Because they understand how to interact with the culture. I think that's vastly different. Well, I've published on that. If you look at my website, I can't remember the exact title of it. It was done in Military Review a couple of years ago. You know, the foreign language knowledge and cultural appreciation is a force builder. And when I say language, I'm not talking about going to DLI. I'm talking somebody like myself. I'm bilingual. I can sit down. I could probably even, I haven't, don't use it every day, I could even have a philosophical discussion with a native speaker mm-hmm. and talk about philosophy. DLI doesn't prepare you for that. But I think somewhere along the line, somebody's gotten smart. And the things that you just brought up is what I hear. There's, number one, there's not the automatic, they're the other and they're, they're not as good as we are. I mean, I was unusual in Vietnam because I said, I'll tell you what, give the NBA the same weapon systems we had. They'd kick our ass. They were good. You know, you come from a totally different upbringing. You have this vast understanding of culture, this diverse background. You speak a second language, and then you're thrust into Vietnam. So you're you're automatically looking at things through a different lens, but you're surrounded by all these other Marines and soldiers who are like, kill them all. And, and I mean, at what point in, at a young age when you're fighting over there in 67, 68, are you like, you guys, like, were you just in survival mode the whole time? Or was there a point where you said, we're, we're never going to win this unless we do this? Well, that's an interesting question because, as I mentioned, down in San Francisco, I went to Vietnam the first time in 67. It was a special program out of the academy. There was 200 of us. Number one, we had to be volunteers. Number two, we had to be screened. And I don't think they made the 200, which I found interesting. And we were supposed to be on ships offshore of Vietnam, i.e. the gun line. And I was on the USS Alt H-63. The commander was a Commander Brady, who just recently died. And my first day on the ship, certainly was in the captain's cabin, it was the wardroom. He had me come in and said, uh, well, Midshipman McKay, are you going Navy Aviation, Navy Line when you get out? And I said, no, sir, I'm going to the Marine Corps. And his his response was, what the hell are you doing on my ship? And I said, I wanted to see what's what's going on. He said, I tell you what, I'm going to break orders and I'm going to break Navy policy. I'm going to put you ashore. And he said, I'm going to put you on the swift boats. And he said, I'll write your fitness report, but I'm not going to keep you on the ship because you want to see what it's like. That was another break. I came out of that. I worked with First Anglico up in... Because uh, you, you were an infantry officer. I mean, No, I was a midshipman. You were a midshipman at the time. Okay. First class midshipman. Worked with Anglico in down around a place called Southern i Cape Mine, Batango. And I felt sorry for those guys. And the real eye-opener was I got on the swift boats. And uh, I was up and down the whole coast of Vietnam. I went down to Bang Tao, never got into the Mekong Delta. And, you know, we were intercepting junks, going through uh, nook bomb bats, bats as big as this room. And they that stinks. <laughs> and, and, you know, I watched these people. I watched how the Americans treated them. And the, and the Navy, U.S. Navy, was pretty good. The Swift people were pretty good. And they had some that spoke some Vietnamese. I said, we can't win this war. This episode of the Break It Down Show is brought to you by Lions Rock Productions. That's us. We publish, evaluate, and develop podcasts just like this one, consult others to build their own, and create associated content and content marketing strategies. So if you're launching or expanding your social media presence, your business, or your personal brand, or if you just want to take your media presence to the next level, reach out to us on Twitter at Pete A. Turner or at John LG69 at the Break It Down Show. There's a thousand ways to get a hold of us. Now enjoy the show.
in the Navy, U.S. Navy was pretty good. The SWIFT people were pretty good. And they had some that spoke some Vietnamese. I said, we can't win this war. Even as a midshipman? As a midshipman, first class in 1967. So, back, so walk me through that, John. You go back to the academy. You've got this unheard of experience as a midshipman. I mean, that just would not happen. This They're not going to like, hey, we're going to fly a... Uh, you know, 747 of 10 midshipmen over to Afghanistan just to get a taste of this. Yeah. They're going to see the worst of humanity in the war and then they're going to go back, graduate. And then how do, I mean, how do you, what are you talking to your fellow minis about? What do you, how does, you know, you're like, nah, this really isn't for me or did it add fuel to your fire? Like, I, I find that, I find that so fascinating is you're a midshipman about ready to enter active duty service. Right. And you're looking at a war that the country's immersed in, embroiled in this war, boiling I'm over. We and you're win. thinking, I can't win, we can't win this thing. But you're still going to go over, which you do. And Let me and, just say this real quick, too. Your website is coloneljohnmckay.com. C-O-L John McKay.com. And then you've published in the last, well, that article on language yeah, is 2016. Well, so for a guy that's like, we can't win, you're still fighting all these years later too i just wanted to say that real quick to the audience no that know. yeah it's it's, it's incredible huge, but, but to, so take us to that like s- s- that snapshot of you go back off the ship after being in country and seeing that and then you got to graduate and then pick up well not only graduate but with the full knowledge you were coming back and you had to be infantry not because anybody said right. because you I get an to. option for those listeners that don't know. It's like you could go into the navy, the big navy, or you can marine option and go, or you could go into marine air. In marine air, yeah. Now you got to think of the political situation. What happened in March of 1968, gentlemen? You're the history teacher. I don't teach history. I teach geography. President Johnson says he will not run for re-election. Nixon is campaigning on peace. Read the cards. We've lost. We want to get out. And yet, it wasn't I had to go. I wanted to go. Can I hold up? Can I do it? What did you have to prove and and to who? Myself. Given all you had done, though. Yeah, but nobody had ever shot at me. Nobody had ever tried to kill me. (laughs) Right, but... You know, Sergeant Kelly's like, this is impossible. You might be able to pull off the impossible. You did. Well, you still were trying to prove it to yourself? Uh, there, there's kid there's a big the difference train? of doing academic and trying to get into a college and going against somebody aiming at you to kill you. Uh, well, there, there, there's a big difference. I'm sorry. So you, you go and do it, and I was just talking about this to a civilian lawyer at lunch, is uh, a guy that's, you know, been shot at and in a couple combat zones uh you know I, I used to remark at how the young marines would get in their first firefight and they all they all have visions of running into battle against an inferior trained enemy and it's going to be glorious and we're going to kill them all and right when the round starts smacking the wall next to them they're like this is not that and i'm not a big fan of getting shot at for the record uh <laughs> it, yeah the romance of that shit wore off real quick but you know for the young guys like there's a lot of allure and romance to that until that one singular moment where their best friend goes down right next to them. And, and, and that's really when you realize, yeah, you've proved something, but you also understand that the immense sacrifice you cost. Made that cost. cost. I joined uh, hotel two five December, 1968. They were in the jungle. It was operation Taylor common. Look it up that night. And it was deep jungle, triple canopy. And Margo knows some of these guys. That night, some kid had had dysentery, and he got outside the perimeter in the jungle. And one of the guys on the line shot. He didn't. He didn't hit him. We we just got in the M16. Didn't hit him, but there was a piece of shrapnel went into his penis. And try to get a helicopter in at 0200 in the morning in triple canopy, no moon. We didn't get him out for about two hours, but he had bled out. That was my initiation to fire. Corman, he was my platoon corpsman at the time, his Doc Sonderman, Margot knows him. He still has nightmares about that. He said, I should have medevaced him three days before because he had dysentery. 
nothing yeah there's it for for people that don't understand too that the corpsman that to make those life and death decisions he was an 18 year old kid 19 20 years old 19 yeah yeah you know with the yeah because you the, the immense responsibility it. that uh i think i just like to always share that because uh you know if people haven't listened to our show we get a lot of military guests on and authors and some you know but to really gain that perspective is like oh why didn't he do that why he's a doctor we call him doc but no he's a 19 year old kid yeah. who gets eight weeks of training on how to jam a wad of you know cotton into a wound and yeah. like stick a guy with a needle and in, in, in an iv bag and that's hopefully going to save their life they get a lot better training now but uh, i think that people understand is you're surrounded by all this chaos and and you and these are the those small pieces of trauma that you accumulate in war and in life and you you got to figure out a way to either keep them packed up or, or unpack them at some point in your life and it's not always easy well uh, two days later was the first firefight and and this this sounds absolutely ridiculous you know i i i had no problem reacting i had no problem. it was in the jungle you don't know where the hell the fire is coming from and i hadn't been around long enough that i could you know locate yeah. Direction by sound, and and I, I remember yelling to get a gun up, machine gun, and I'm thinking at the same time, why would anybody want to kill me? <laughs> <laughs> I'm a nice guy, goddamn it! Who the, I never why are these guys anything? trying to kill me? I don't even know I'm this a, guy. I'm a swell yeah. guy, and and he, he's trying to kill me. You get over that real quick. Yeah, there's something that happens when you first have a bullet whiz by or whatever it is or or like your corpsman you know who probably had had to make that life or death decision didn't have a sense for when life and death starts you know but once you're in that fight it gets real clear like this is serious and that, like, i remember when when combat slowed down for me where i'm like i'm doing quotey fingers calm in this moment because it was no longer faster than i could handle it had slowed down does that resonate with you at all? You know, I, I, I'm probably fantasizing. I never, there were times at night when we got attacked, I never felt completely out of control. I felt very concerned, and I take a great deal of pride in that because I've watched other men under extreme duress. And some people break, uh, and and you know whether you break or not doesn't really matter if you're wearing a gold bar or a chevron. And I never felt I reached that point. You know, some of the people that I know, you know, that have been in really bad things, would you have held up as well? I I feel I did. What about something like Way City, where it's just the incessant same damn stuff i don't know i i never felt that i lost control and yes it was very chaotic but i took a certain pride in that i could operate within that chaos and the other consideration after we came off at taylor common we went back into the rice paddies uh, right before i was wounded the first time this was another thing uh, you know jim webb does it very well in his book fields of fire the Arizona Territory, up north of Anwa, on the Song Tabon River. It dawned on me very early, whether you were running squad patrols, which I would take half of those. Usually we ran platoon patrols, and it wasn't, it wasn't 48 men or 49 men. You know, uh, I was lucky if I had 32 with guns and rockets attached. That's what you were dealing with. Every time you went outside the perimeter, whether it was a company perimeter or a battalion perimeter, you took casualties. And your prayer, your prayer going out of the wire was, God, don't let anybody die today. Every single time, though. Somebody Every died. time you went out, yeah. somebody got hurt. Yeah. You know, when I talked to to gentlemen like you and e even some of my world war ii vets uh you know guys we've had herschel woody williams on the show yeah. and uh you know when you hear stories like that it really is it really does again illuminate the fact that war is timeless and 
you know, even for our generation in certain circumstances. And there's these, you know, a war is this sine wave of high periods and low periods of fighting. And some people are thrust into the high point. Some people sit in the lows and the doldrums, but those that experience those really punctuated, intense, chaotic moments, you do say to yourself every time you leave the wire, it's, it's, it's not a matter of if we're going to get shot at, it's when and how much. And what are and, you going to suffer? And yeah, and, and yeah. what what's going to happen? This and having those plans to really take care of your boys, and hope that you know you can get them out in time. It, it, it's 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 overwhelming, and to have the mental toughness like you did. What have you thought about some of the people? I think they're personally like sycophants if if, if they think that because some people break in war, they're they're less of a a soldier, they're less of a marine. I I just feel that. There's so many different levels of the human condition that I, having seen so much and experienced so many different levels, like I can't help but feel some some sympathy or empathy in some cases for others that I don't think them less of a Marine because of how they reacted to that because everyone is programmed differently. Have you experienced that from commanders you've worked for or fellow Marines or these uh, battle-hardened I've, guys that say, oh, he's not suffering, like I've seen suffering? Yeah, I've experienced that. And I, I like to use the example, and, and he doesn't mind, by the way, General Morgan, former assistant commandant of the Marine Corps. In Korea, General Morgan froze in the cockpit. He was an aviator. He froze in the cockpit. He couldn't fly his plane. And I got to know General Morgan very well because I, I had all the black programs at headquarters, which were very few. Marine Corps wasn't in at that level. Five of those programs, only General Morgan and I were the only ones who could, could know about it. I'd work with the other services with it, but the Commandant didn't even know about it. And we got to know each other pretty well. And he said, I don't know what happened to me, John. He said, I went on. I got involved in aerial combat twice after that. I acquitted myself well. It's never repeated itself. But he said, I could not fly the plane. Mm. He made four stars, and I think he was a very competent officer. Roundabout way to answer your question. Yeah, I mean, that's a great example. I mean, yeah. I've never heard that story either, but I'm always talking about that, using those words about, and for for General Morgan to share that story with you, I think is indicative of what I value in great leaders, is sharing the wins and the losses with subordinates. And that takes a lot of time. It takes a lot of character, which I didn't have, I think, as a younger guy, as a younger officer, because we breed this culture of, you know, bravado and, and hubris at times and, you know, pounding our chests. And it, it does take some age and wisdom to to really develop that. And I, if I could go back and cut out those words like ego and pride and and impatience, I I just cut them out like a cancer in my career because I think they made they made me a less effective officer, a less effective leader. And I'm not saying that I did things bad, but I think that that's a, such a great story of being able to share those things. And I like to be human. I think the Marines can understand that. And you know, this is a is a Mustang too, which is for those that aren't listening. You know, it's a horse of many different breeds. So you got a little officer, a little bit of enlisted, but the Marines see that in you and they, they have a balance. So there, there, there's a connection, but you know, Mustang officers, I always viewed as like, they're either really, really good or they're really think like I've been there, done that. And sometimes the rules don't apply. So it, it's not always a, a, a benefit. If sometimes people ask me the yeah. question, I'm going to ask you this question. I'm not going to give the answer. Do you think being enlisted made you a better officer? Absolutely. And you have to remember, I finished boot camp, I finished ITR, end of August, 1962. I was designated for an artillery MOS, you know, what the hell, what, what, what it was, 57, 08, 57, something like that, artillery battery. And I was ordered uh, to first uh, field artillery group at uh, 29 Palms, which was part of the old force troops, Pacific. Now, you know, of course, the WAGs in the Marine Corps break down first field artillery to initials in its first fag, so that, you know. So you got that going for you. Uh -huh. <laughs> we mounted out. We mounted out for Cuba. Now, first field artillery group did not go as a group. They 
supplemented 11th Marines. And I was a newbie. And I remember right before we, we, I mean, they were convoying back and forth from 29 Palms to Coronado, loading ships. I remember convoy duty, and I remember sitting in the goddamn sun weaving camouflage nets. Now, did that make me a better officer? Probably not. But, uh, you know, I know what it, what it took. And then we went. We, we sailed. It was a big group. I, I don't know. You know, second division was standing by already, and it was chuck and jive all the way down to the Panama Canal. We were running blackout. We weren't supposed to go out on deck at night. You know, that blackout curtains. This was this was real stuff. You know, victory at sea and all that shit. And we got down to Panama. We traversed the canal at night, blackout. We got over to Cologne. We sailed off, lost landfall, and. We're told to muster, we're on an LST, USS Holmes County. Told to muster on the tank deck. And they said, okay, boys and girls, start breaking out the artillery rounds and matching them up with the fuses. We're going to land. And I'm going, I just turned 18. Kennedy had given his speech. And I'm going, wow. And the old LSTs, they were all diesel engines. Troop quarters were in the, right over the engines. We were four deep, no air conditioning. Diesel fumes coming up. I didn't sleep for long. I didn't. What's this going to be like? What's this going to be like? And we steamed around. Steamed. And thank God we didn't leave. Both those beaches, uh, the two units that were going to land was 1st Marine Division, reinforced by elements of 2nd, um, and the 7th Infantry Division out of uh, uh, Fort Ord. As it's come out in a book that was published in 2008. Uh, Margaret and I went to the book signing. Both those beaches were, were targeted with tactical nuclear weapons by the Russians. And as the author states, the Russian commander had release authority in Cuba. Been a crispy critter. You know, wouldn't be sitting here talking to you today. I didn't know that until 2008. But So I had that. You know, I turned 18. I'm supposed to be doing an amphibious landing against an opposed beach. It gets you thinking. But not the same thing when somebody's shooting at you. And why the fuck does he want to shoot me? I didn't do anything to him. Yeah. It don't matter. That's a pretty uh, historical precursor, talking about the Cuban Missile Crisis and, like, floating through the canal and then doing laps around, at yeah. that time, uh, you know, our sworn enemy, you know, Fidel Castro and the, the massing of Russian troops and, yeah. uh, you know, Kennedy's decision and and what some view is great wherewithal and patience to, you know, let that situation unfold the way it did through diplomacy and also shows, of, you know, multiple shows of force. Yeah. And then, so you don't, you're a young, you're a young Marine too. And you're embarked on amphibious You're like, this is it. I'm going to war. What every Marine wants. And then they're like, nope, game's called on account of rain. So you got to go back. But then again, you ultimately got your game day in, in Vietnam in 67 when you went in. And, you know, I, I let me quote Margo. I, I know I'm different. I was brought up different. I, I, I've had different experiences. And, and I think one of the things that is one of my strengths, and again, wave the red flag, Marco, but I think, I think about those things. It's not, oh, well, shit, that's happened, you know, let's move on. I don't dwell on it, but what does this mean? How does this affect me? How would I act? And I'm not saying I'm the only person that does that, but I haven't met too many other people that have. So people from your your peer group, your generation, guys you grew up through the Marine Corps, and how many how many years did you spend in the Marine Corps when you retired? 37. 37 years. Non hacker. Guy dropped his back, couldn't do 40. Like I couldn't, I, couldn't I make quit it. I quit at twenty four, so I'm even weaker than you. He didn't but, make uh, forty. Yeah, it's weak. Didn't ask uh, for the waiver after sixty two. <laughs> but when you when you when you talk to your, your 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 peer group, are you one of those guys that likes to talk about what you've learned from all those lessons, or just sit around and tell fucking war stories all day? No, uh, I think, and and Margo's been with me. I mean, we we, we have, as you probably gathered, we have a very unique marriage. Uh, she goes with me every place. 
war stories. I, I told you in the email, you know, you start talking about war story, it's either bullshit or it's a macho deal. I'm not interested. In I, I, don't, I don't need to prove myself to anybody. Yeah. Why? How did we get there? What did we do or didn't do? How does that affect the Marine Corps? How does it affect my troops? How does it affect the country? Yeah, I like to talk about that. I think that's, I, I think, I mean, that's my answer too, is no, we don't like to sit around. The, that's why people ask me, do you belong to the VFW? Do you belong to American Legion? I'm like, no, I don't, because I don't enjoy what the, I'm not saying they're not great organizations, don't do, do good things, but I guess I'm stereotyped to the, the fact that I don't want to go sit in an environment and listen to guys talk about war. I want to talk about things like this, about why did we do those things? And then your understanding of the world stage, not only through your upbringing, but through what you're teaching now through geography and, you know, Latin American culture and through Middle Eastern culture at, you know, Cal State, Sacramento. And how do we get better? How do we move forward with this? And, and as and I'm no academic, I don't at least put myself in that bucket, but I do like to write about those things and engage people like you that have a vast perspective oh, yeah. on how how do we get better at these things? How do we continue to not only support our military, build our country, make it stronger? So our bumper stickers always say number one, America. You know, I think those are the real discussions that we that we really need to engage uh, and, and, well, and not, and not I'm, be I'm, I'm scared got, to have them. I've got thoughts. I mean, you in a different context have been exposed to the Muslim world. Nobody was shooting at me when I worked with Muslims. And as I've said before, and, and I will tell anybody to their face, I thought they were great people. They had their shitbirds. You know, they had their bad people. But I don't need to go to Saudi Arabia or Palestine to find them. I walk down a couple blocks and find some of those. I don't know. This is a pretty nice neighborhood. Uh, it'd be hard for us. It's pretty man. swanky. Yeah, it's pretty, yeah. it's pretty highbrow for McKay. I mean, he's so, really moved up in the world. That's so. it. <laughs> Oh, that's Margo. You married up, like, <laughs> mo married like up. most of us. Yeah, so <laughs> she's shaking her head. Yeah, she's like, of course he did. <laughs> but read, read my article, if you would. And, and you know, I, I, I think I told Scott, I did the Spanish. I didn't do the Portuguese. That's been translated, in, in its, and it's in the uh, Military Review Portuguese and Spanish editions. Again, a um, year and a half, two years old. But I, I, I think it's a very good article in the sense of, what we ought to be looking at. And going back to what you just said, and I certainly, I emphasize it in my class, you know, how do you get rid of prejudice? How do you get rid of bigotry? Are the Marine Corps, the Army, the Navy, are they working on that? Uh, not in the sense that here's the lesson plan to get rid of bigotry. But in the Slide sense, one. <laughs> yeah, right. But in the sense, I know oh, the captain that wrote that. He's a jackass. <laughs> <laughs> so that is, I hate that guy. You know, <laughs> don't be intolerant. <laughs> and, and he got is, a name for that, John. <laughs> if, if you go to, uh, we're off topic here, but you go to the muse, museum. The letters there. I, I think it was written in seventeen. It was after the Revolutionary War, seventeen eighty-seven. It was a major on a captain, you know, because it's all handwritten out in that 18th century handwriting. And I mean, he's a scoundrel. He's a, he's a womanizer. He's a drunk. I mean, it just goes on and on and on. And the kicker is, and beside that, he's an Irishman. And I mean, <laughs> <laughs> always a good insult. <laughs> and, you know, I, I see it. Margot has seen it. And, and I hate to admit it, no names named, in our own families. Oh, he's from India. I won't have anything to do with those people. He's black. No, no. I don't know how you get rid of that. And, and, and to have the tolerance. I mean, yes, I have different upbringing. I've got a much broader view of things. As I've said, and I shock. I shock some of our family members. I, you know, I love the Muslims. I think they're fantastic people. And I just wish I had enough time in my busy day 
that I could study things like the Quran. Yeah, pragmatism is not uh, one of our leadership traits or principles that we see in the schools professional warriors attend. And guys like you, guys like, uh, I'll throw Marlantis' name out there, or maybe even a guy like Jim Webb, who tend to come through all the things in your generation that you did. It's a little bit of little bit of tendency, although they respect the work that they've done as artists and sharing the stories, kind of put them in this category of, oh, you're you're turning against your organization, or you're too you're too liberal, or you're I, I call it just being smart about things and being progressive. And that's one of the things that I'm gonna ask you is with not just a racial issue, which was a massive hot button issue in the sixties and seventies in the Marine Corps as we transitioned. But what about now? We've got homosexuals in the military. We've got transgender issues arising. And we just graduated the first fully integrated female recruit training company from India Company. What do you think about that? And I like asking a guy from your generation. With I've published on that. Yeah. I've published on that. I won the... Uh, but in short, you're in favor of it. No, no. I'm not. I'm going to weasel out. I'm going to say... It's like marijuana today. Maybe we ought to step back and take a real hard look at this. And what do we want and how are we going to get there? I wrote an a essay in 2012. It won the MOA essay contest. And I asked those questions. It's on my website. No, it's not. I, MOA wouldn't give me copyright. I think it's a damn good essay. And, and it is, it's asking those questions. I did a book review, which is on my website, in parameters, on McGinnis's book, uh, which which has an inflammatory title. But I, I bring up those issues. I use the review to express my own views, okay? And I think that's a good review. And there's a lot of aspects of it. You know, I don't know what infantry fighting is like today. If, if there were women... In Vietnam, even in very good shape, and I got this. I got this from, believe it or not, some uh, looking at some dead bodies, v, uh, NBA dead bodies. Now they use women a lot for couriers, and they used some of them for sappers. This is very gross, but they had serious problems with women hygiene, and and these are natives. I mean, they're from they're from the region. Strength, I think, is an issue. Uh, there's been very recently a couple of articles. The VA is being overwhelmed by women veterans that are having problems, combat or conflict related, that they weren't seeing in men. Is the society prepared to pick that up? And the last thing, the last thing, I, I really get upset about this. You put men and women together, particularly at 17, 18, 19, 20 years old, and guess what? And you put them under stress, guess what, twice. And some of them get killed, and things happen, and guess what, three times. That is not good for unit integrity, in my opinion. And, and that's my reservation. Mm. I've commanded women units, not women units. I've commanded units with women in it. Now, it was peacetime, and it was static, JTF-160. The problems I had with fraternization, you know, and and I saw in my own three shop, and, and we were downsizing I just, as we got the migrants to the States, and most of them came to the States. You know, population dwindled, I took over, it was over 12,000. My, my troop strength with civilians, you know, NGOs and all that crap, uh, was just under 4,000. And we shrunk. And, and we did a damn good job of it. Uh, that's the reason you never read about it, yeah. because it, it was so successful. We shut it down early. But in my own three shop, I had an army colonel, which was an interesting thing also in the sense that I was a colonel. All my chief staff personnel... And my component commanders, Navy, Air Force, and Army, were all colonels. Mm. Now, you know, that's, that's a leadership challenge. And I'm the boss. Doesn't really get it. You understand what I'm talking about? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm the commander. That doesn't really get it. 
let's shift gears real quick because we were i mean we we could we could do like multiple episodes on this with everything you do but for this yeah. for this episode with all of the experience like through your life and through the marine corps and like the challenge you're still teaching now you're still leading you're you're, you're teaching at sac state she what, makes me what, <laughs> <laughs> she's got a high lifestyle she needs to maintain up here a very high brow but what is it that you what is it that you love the most about sharing your your life experiences with with those you teach now and and also with the veteran community that you're still really connected to because I know you're at the club you still associate with a lot of marine organizations what what is that message that you that you love to share with them like what is it that you wake up every morning you're like god I can't wait to teach these kids this to mentor young people mentor them in the sense of personal responsibility that there is an obligation to something higher than yourself. I, I think Mario will share that. We, we, I've been very fortunate. I've, I've had some very good students. I don't know if I mentioned at the club. I've got three that have gone in or will go in as commissioned officers, U.S. Armed Forces. We have a gal that you want to talk about a real horror story of being brought up brother was a Marine, was in Iraq, came back, overdosed, committed suicide. Her sister, mainline heroin, she never told Margo and I. She's been to the house several times. I think her father abused her sexually, and she just got into a master's program down in Fresno. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, the only thing I have to forewarn you about, and Margo will tell you the same thing, she'll drink you under the table. <laughs> <laughs> she's very pretty. She's very pretty. And the type of people you're dealing with, and I, 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 I gravitate towards this. Second day of class, my first day of class was, I think, a Thursday. So I had the weekend. And the next one was Tuesday or whatever it was. And she came in all beat up. And another kid that I think is going to get into the Air Force is, as a commissioned officer, this Russian kid, no less, Dennis. I said, Dennis, none of my business, but is your boyfriend whooping up on her? Dennis steps back and he goes, Professor, she plays rugby. <laughs> 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 That's the type of person I can gravitate to. And, yeah. and, and if I can channel that type of energy, that's, that's what gives me a sense that's of accomplishment. Best. We've had you for it. Well over an hour. It's easy to do, and there's so much more to talk about. So we'll have to do another one of these. But I just have one more question for you. And on the Scott, record or off the record? On the record. Okay. And Scott can ask whatever he wants. But we had Jack Brennan on, and a lot of times I like to ask, you know, our guests that have a lot of experience and wisdom, you know, questions that kind of guide us, mentor us a little bit. And, you know, we get inflamed about President Trump and this problem and this political divide. And this is the worst time ever. And, and I just, I always say that's just nonsense because there's been – the Revolutionary War, your era was extremely, you know, combative and everything. What What are your thoughts? What, what Where are we at right uh, now? You know, Margo, Margo, and rightfully so. We, we, we've we got three boys between us. All of them have served. Uh, we worry about their futures. And, yeah, people people do get very incensed one way or the other, yeah. you know, either pro or, or against uh, President Trump. I, I have my own personal feelings. I I, I keep telling Margo, step back. Mm -hmm. Look at the Democratic National Convention in 1968. Yeah. Look at the Democratic nomination process where you had a person that was revealed having gone through psychiatric treatment. You know, he was going to be a contender. You had Richard Nixon and Watergate. I, I mean, to me, Watergate was probably one of the more critical crisis we've mm -hmm. had in this country. Yeah. Now, regardless of what your position is and thoughts about President Trump, I don't think he's going to go down in history as one of the greats, but I can't get wrapped around the axle. And I, I used to make Margot upset because I said, you know, going back to January, February this year, I said, the Mueller report's not going to find anything. There's going, to, there's going to be a lot of dirt. 
there's going to be things that are going to fall out afterwards. And I said, watch, watch the Attorney General of New York. Watch the federal prosecutor in the Southern District of New York. That's what's going to come out yeah. there. And I was feeling vindicated on the way up. I wrote an article as this was unfolding called right. Protecting Your Tribe. Bob Muller. Hey, Bob, if you're listening, magnificent bastard, 2-4. I want to stick by the guy. And I says, hey, you know what? He's a Republican. He's conservative. And he's doing his job. He's not a criminal, not indicted. So I said, stop ganging up on Mueller. And he's done a great job. And every guy I knew in close protection that worked with him, Marines, said he is the guy. And so I feel a little vindicated. And I published an article against all the sage yeah. <laughs> mentors I had, and I won't mention any names like Scotty, hit the brakes on this. And so I feel like, it, but I also told Bob Mulder at the same time in the article, which he didn't respond to. He's a pretty busy guy. But I said, at the end of the day, too, publish a report, man. Come on. It's been two years. Ten million bucks a year. I, I hope he does. And we got that. Yeah. So, I uh, and Bob, I think if you listen to, we want you in the 2-4 Association, brother. And on the Break It Down but, Show. And on the Break It Down Show. You know, I, I met him very briefly. And uh, another little episode, as I think Scotty knows, I testified in the Iran-Contra hearings. Oh, no kidding. For the government, uh, specifically against North. Which was classified for a long time. Yeah, yeah it, may, it may still be. Yeah. And I also, based on that testimony, had an Article 32 for violation of the War Powers Act. And a very clever Navy Captain Jag, I was a lieutenant colonel. He was smart enough that uh, War Powers Act had never been tried in court. It's never been tried. It won't be tried. It'll be declared unconstitutional. But he was going to make sure I perjured myself. And that's big time. Yeah. I, I think it's worth noting, too, because John's such a humble guy. Like Some of your classmates at the academy and some of the guys you grew up in with are some pretty notable people that he knows <laughs> quite quite well and we were talking about this in the marines memorial club like just because what that's what's so cool about this is the john mckay's of the world they're not in the limelight they're not glory hounds they're not you know seekers of fame yeah. yet they've done all these great things but you're very well connected and have close personal relationships with mike mullen jim mike webb. mullen J jim webb who else? Well, we were talking about this at the club. It's just, it was just fascinating because you just you never know. You're looking at yeah. the, you, you're looking at this guy, and, and we've done this before. And you sit around like, I wonder who that guy knows. Yeah, and you, you just the... never know until you like. And you guys know me. Like, I just introduced myself. I'm kind of a nosy guy because I'm a writer and I'm a marine, so I'm a little boisterous. And I was actually like probably hitting on Margo and like <laughs> complimenting her and John steps up. He's like, Hey, marine, wash yourself. You know, he's like giving all this about counseling. But you know, it's it's interesting to. When we sat up there and you started talking, and, and it wasn't until after that in our short short friendship that, uh, you know, just another great guy that, uh, John, I, I'm, I mean, I'm proud to, you know, call you fellow Marine and a friend. Oh, and, uh, absolutely. absolutely. We, we loved having you on the show, Margo, for having us in your home. and for Back the wall checking. Walnut cake, yeah, bullshit, you know, checking as, as, we're, as we're sitting here. And uh, it, it'd be great to do it, do it again. Yeah, I mean, for sure. For sure. If people want to find out more about uh, what you do, they want to go to your website, which is what? He's got his, uh, Colonel John and I'll put that in the show notes. www.coljohnmckay. Put it out. It's, yeah, uh, we'll have it on the we'll have it on the show notes and uh, on the website. It's, it's not up to date. Uh, you might mention that because I haven't put the yeah. Gold Star Mothers. I've had a couple of uh, something else published. I was guest of honor at a junior ROTC graduation. A bunch of stuff we've done we got to put up there, and I've got to make a couple of corrections. You're a busy dude. You get things done. That's that's why I can't do these gadgets. Because <laughs> you're out doing things. <laughs> and, you know, Margo enjoys TV, serious TV, except there's a little niche. that right? Everybody gets to have a little niche. It's all right. Yeah. yeah police procedurals as i call them yeah. but uh, seriously she's a wonderful muse and you know like a lot of us uh, i came back from vietnam i um, you know i i one too much later i was in el salvador killing people again almost getting killed very tragic thing happened to me there and you know slowly over a period of time i fell into a bottle of whiskey and 
know, my brothers were aware of it. It was never talked about. It was sort of like the crazy uncle in the basement syndrome. She's the one that pulled me out. Muse is high praise. I don't think there be any more than, than that as, as far as someone that inspires you in your life to keep keep moving. When you do hit those low points and you slip and fall and someone grabs you by the back and picks you up and you keep marching. So. Yeah, but a lot of people don't get picked up. No, Scott, they don't. A lot of people don't. We're, we're lucky to have this Marine Corps family and you know each other to, to do that and in some cases. I think that's important. So, But she's, uh, uh, you know, I... I Everybody was lauding me for the talk down in San Francisco, and yeah, I, I put my heart and soul into that. She helped. That's good. She helped. <laughs> <laughs>